Tonight we have with us uh, as our speaker on Saudi Arabia at home and abroad, M. Gordon Daniels. Mr. Daniels has served about 25 years in the Foreign Service, and he has had a number of diverse assignments in Latin America and uh, a number of countries of Latin America, and most notably in the last four years of his uh, career before his retirement in 1980 in Saudi Arabia itself. His training is in economics. He was an academic for about 10 years prior to entering the Foreign Service in 1961. And as an academic, he had numerous honors. He served at the University of El Salvador in 1950 and 51. He was a Fulbright Scholar at the uh, Central University in Quito, Ecuador. And he was also a recipient of Ford Foundation grants uh, in numerous, uh, in at least in a couple different uh, areas here. In the Foreign Service, as I mentioned, he has served in a number of different posts. Uh, prior to his assignment in Saudi Arabia, he primarily served in the Latin American region, in Colombia, Chile, Bolivia, and Panama. He also, as a uh, foreign service officer, uh, was de deputy director of intelligence research for Latin America in 1974 and 1975. And then from 1975 through 1979, uh, he was uh, an economics officer in Saudi Arabia. And for two years of those, uh, his term in Saudi Arabia, he was deputy chief of mission. So in that sense, he comes well qualified to speak to us about American foreign policy and about the Middle East and about Saudi Arabia uh, in particular. So it is with a great deal of joy that I present to you uh, M. Gordon Daniels to talk tonight about Saudi Arabia at home and abroad. <clears throat> Dr. McCormick has just given me a pointer, and uh, that's much better than the State Department would have. We'd have to use our fingers, <laughs> but not quite up to Pentagon speed because that's chrome steel and it has a little button and it speaks out. <laughs> but uh, this, at least, uh, I wouldn't use my finger, which is not plight. I'm very appreciative to the members of the University Lectures Committee for having invited me, and to Dr. McCormick, whom I met at Texas A&M University as diplomat in residence. I attended his class in American foreign policy <clears throat> to have an opportunity to see what the academics were telling the students about the State Department. It turned out that his script was very good, and I learned quite a bit. Coming into your beautiful campus, that is to say, arriving in Des Moines uh, yesterday evening around sunset, brilliant sky. And uh, as we were leaving the airport and coming through the city, my eyes suddenly caught a great glimmer on the horizon uh, with minarets. And I thought we might be entering Mecca. <laughs> but Dr. McCormick told me it was not the great mosque in Mecca. It was the state capitol building. <laughs> and I recognized then the minarets aren't quite high enough. But if you can adjust them just a little bit upwards, you've practically got a full-blown mosque over there. Well, I want to talk to you. I did not come to read a formal paper. As I told an earlier session this morning, if I had something so elegant as that, it should be in print, but rather to share with you some observations based on experiences in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, an area of the world which is very much on our minds these days. And I do have a bit of an outline. I'd like to speak first a little bit about the royal family. It seems to me that Americans cannot really understand very much about Saudi Arabia. That's three syllables in that word, by the way. It's not Saudi, it's Saudi, and I do have friend here in the audience who will correct my weak Arabic, but it is a three-syllable word. Americans tend to call it Saudi, and it really grates on your nerves. Um, to talk a little bit about the royal family, 
uh, the kingdom, the royal family, something about its economy, under which I have three points I'd like to cover, a little bit about petroleum, a little bit about their plans for economic development, and something about labor, because that's very important in the mix, current situation in the kingdom. Then the second major point, uh, something about social conditions. The second major point would then have to do with Saudi Arabian foreign relations, that is to say, objectives that they have, of which we might identify at least four, mention them in passing just in summary, something about domestic and external security, something about the advance of Islam, the ideology, the religion. The kingdom is a theocracy. Something about the containing or limiting of the advance of the superpowers, especially the Soviet Union and ourselves in the region. And finally, a key foreign policy objective, the return of Palestine to Arab control. Then if time permits, uh, uh, something on the Mideast conflict and hopes for a possible solution there, but it might not be possible to get to this. And in any event, we had covered this material in an earlier session this morning. And it would be somewhat redundant for those who were in that session. But before I begin my remarks about the royal family, which may sound a little bit more like genealogy to you, but I think it's extremely important because of questions that are raised in the minds of Westerners particularly and the intelligence community generally about the stability of the House of Al Saud. But a word or two about this interesting part of the world. The Arabian Peninsula, rather vast piece of land here, is equal to one third, the eastern one third of the United States. It's not small. Uh, this might be around Bismarck, North Dakota. So that would take you down to Norfolk, Virginia, for example. Uh, it's uh, about two hours, hour and a half, two hours, jet time from Jeddah to Riyadh, a little more than an hour from Riyadh to Dahran on the principal uh, domestic route of Saudi International Airlines. I have traveled most of the kingdom. I have not been down in the empty quarter. Few Westerners have. But there's an enormous area down here that corresponds to most Americans' ideas about the peninsula. Enormous amounts of sand and sand dunes, which rise to 800,000 feet, constantly shifting and moving. There is water in the area, curiously enough. There are wells. There are, there are small wells. And Arab trackers who know the area from time immemorial can somehow or other set out across the desert and find those tiny spots. It's the most inhospitable place. And the Saudi character seems to me is a product of this inhospitable environment. He's learned to live with very, very little and survive in ways which I think most Westerners would not find possible. But now he's on the threshold of greater things. The whole area, geologically, was once a seabed. Later, uh, was exposed to, to uh, vegetation and habitation. And the stream bed can be seen in the rocks. You have to fly over it to see it. It was forested and so on. But something happened at one stage or another, and this whole shield tilted this way from, we could say, roughly east to west, so that the high land is on this side, the highest being down at this pit. However, there are some very high peaks down here in Oman. So we get six, 7,000 feet altitudes of barren Rocky Mountains, uh, but they're really a, a spectacular beauty unto themselves. Then the whole thing flows this way with a great central plateau, the Nedj, much of it appears not unlike our own Arizona and New Mexico. There is vegetation. It's lots of rock, but there is soil, and some of it adaptable to agriculture. And the third development plan of the Saudi government is, in Congress, as it may seem to you and me, sitting in this magnificent Iowa black topsoil, parenthesis, I'm very disturbed about the three long articles I read in the Washington Post about losing all your topsoil to erosion. 
um, sitting here in this uh, wonderful agricultural area, how the Saudis could really hope to do much in the way of agriculture, but they intend to become not self-sufficient, but nearly so in any number of grains and other products in a few years. Well, what about the royal family? The intelligence question asked by every intelligence service in the world today, probably somewhere in the priority of reporting requirements, is how stable is the kingdom? How stable is the royal family? What are the prospects for sudden or abrupt change? The reason why that's a very, very pressing intelligence question within the US government is, of course, the traumatic effects of Iran. Parenthesis. If I were to speak out of the experience of some 25 years of being a reporter and analyst in the Foreign Service, I would make one criticism, perhaps, of the way we go about shaping foreign policy. And my shorthand for it is the one horse theory. We tend to get one horse and ride it. And when our horse collapses, we go into an absolute blue mood. Our world has collapsed, and we have to struggle to find another horse. We need, it seems to me, a rather broader approach over time. But the jargonese in talking with working persons in the business, he's our boy. In other words, somehow or other, he's our horse. And as long as we support that person or those that surround him, our objectives will probably be attained. I myself have found so many horses collapse over the 25 years that really would be interesting to find a slightly different approach to dealing with countries and with peoples. In any event, the question before us right now is how stable is the house of al Saud? So if you'll permit me just a little bit of history, which could be flawed somewhat in some respects, but I hope you won't hold me to strict account on that. I'll try and cover something about the structure of the royal family, and in doing so, explain it a great deal, or hope to explain or convey certain ideas about the way the kingdom operates. But I think I should say here that the key word is consensus. There is a consensus arrived at within the society about how they will be governed and by whom, even though it's a monarchy. It is not absolute in the extreme sense of the word. There are limitations on it. How does it start in Saudi Arabia? The House of Saud traces its origins to the Prophet Muhammad. And the tree, the genealogical tree, is quite straight. Muhammad was born, according to our records, around 570 AD, almost 600 years after the birth of Christ. Parenthesis, the three great religions Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all emerge in this same little pocket of the Middle East within 600 years. It tells you something about the things that interested or caused men's minds to work, uh, that three great religions should emerge in the same area in such a short span, span of time. Muhammad is sometimes regarded as a latter-day prophet of God and that the visions that he received from the angel Gabriel is the basis of his inspiration. In any event, some time later, a disciple, uh, we, we could say a disciple to cast the gentleman in a proper light, uh, a, a religious leader who was really quite extreme, quite fanatic. They had problems in Islam between the loose livers and the strict observers of the faith. And this particular gentleman, Muhammad ibn Wahhab, Wahhab, the Wahhabis and Wahhabism, uh, to use an English term to convey the sense of the Wahhabi is Puritan, Puritanical. The true believers against those who are straying. So they are really strict and very fundamental. Muhammad Ibn Wahhab was forced to flee his village because he was a little extreme for the people in the town. And he took refuge uh, in a, a mud village, Derihya, Derihya, yeah, I more or less pronounce it correct, I hope, which at that time 
uh, was one of the sons of the, of the Sauds, Muhammad ibn Saud. The time here is around 1740. Muhammad ibn Wahab was born around 1703, we think, and died 1792. The local tribal chieftain, Muhammad ibn Saud, took Muhammad ibn Wahab in, and they got along, we could say. An alliance was formed between a tribal sheikh who was attempting to defend the family's stake in the future, if you will, and a preacher of a particular version of what we'll call Islam, a strict believer, a purifier, those who were against the excesses uh, of, of Muslims who were not living up to, say, the tenets of the Quran. Ibn Saud married a daughter of Wahhab and had a son, Abdulaziz. When his father, Muhammad Ibn Saud, died, the alliance between the son and Ibn Wahhab continued up through the death of Wahhab. And the uh, son of that gentleman continued the same policies, which brings us up to around 1814. The reason for this being that the Bedouin tribal people uh, developed a fierce fanaticism for the faith, were organized into armies, and sought to bring the increasing areas of the central part of the peninsula under the control of the Sauds. By around 1803 or so, they had recaptured the holy cities of Medina and Mecca. The area was nominally under the control of the Ottoman Empire with its capital of Istanbul and the viceroy at Cairo. And with the capture of Medina and Mecca, the holy cities, of Islam by the Wahhabis, uh, the, the Sultan in Istanbul ordered the Viceroy mm -hmm. in Cairo to take the Egyptian armies and reconquer the area and drive the Wahhabis, the Saudis, out. And this happened, and from around 1814 to the 1840s, the Egyptians were back in control. Well, the uh, sons of the third successful leader got to squabbling and the leadership of the family's fortunes passed to an uncle of uh, one of the sons of the third king. We don't have to identify all of them. His name was Turkey. And internecine struggles within the family resulted in his assassination but his son, Faisal, a very gifted leader with great charisma, succeeded in restoring the fortunes of the House of Saud, although it's a slightly different branch, a different mother. But the, um, the uh, male line was un unbroken. With Faisal, uh, the fortunes of the family were restored, but on his death, his sons fell to squabbling about succession. And the whole thing went to tatters again until finally the youngest son of that union, uh, Abd al-Rahman, a member of which family we have a lineal descendant seated in this room, uh, succeeded. But in this long passage of time, another Arab family, the Rashids, had become very, very powerful and succeeded in driving Abd al-Rahman out from his ancestral home, which by this time was no longer Diriyah, but now Riyadh, close by, or here. And Abd al-Rahman and his 11-year-old son, and now we come to our hero, uh, Abd al-Aziz. Most northern Westerners know him as Ibn Saud. Abdulaziz fled to Kuwait up here and were taken in by the family there 
Sabah and the linkage between the Sabah and the Abdulaziz families were formed and even until now are very, very close. In 1902, no longer 11, but around 21 years old, the Abdulaziz and just a handful of followers slipped back into the central highlands and lay in wait. Uh, it's still there in Riyadh, sort of a big mound of clay with a hole in it, and they camped there in the night. They waited till dawn. They peeked through the hole. The fellows in the mud fort in town were asleep, and they broke in, recaptured the place for the Sauds. The father renounced his claims to the kingship, but he kept the titular head of the dynasty so far as the faith was concerned. He returned, retained the title of Imam. And young Abdulaziz then began to reorganize the Bedouin forces and a long, slow reconquest of the peninsula begins. This takes him from uh, 1902 to 1932. But he had achieved the bulk of the conquest by 1922. In the course of doing, he had broken heads already with the British. The British were very important in the area. You'll remember that at the end of World War I, we formed something called the League of Nations, and vast amounts of territory were given over to colonial powers as mandates for administration. And all kinds of funny lines were driven by the politicians of the day. Can you imagine these strange lines going across the desert? They have little or no bearing to ethnic, demographic, or any other features, much less geographic features. But the mandate for Britain consisted of Iraq, Transjordan, and Palestine. The mandate for France consisted of present-day Lebanon and Syria, both of which are essentially uh, French-speaking, that is to say, at least as a second language, are French-speaking. The British mandate, of course, the English impress is very strong, and English is the second language. I would say, I think I don't overstate, English is the second language of Saudi Arabia, and certainly is of Jordan. So we have parts of the peninsula under the control of two of the powers from World War I, but two states emerge independent. Saudi Arabia, because Abdulaziz and his camel troops subject the last of the Hashemite rulers, Hussein of Jordan is a Hashemite that's distinct from the Saudi, drives them out. He takes a big chunk of the other state that emerges, Yemen. And for you and me, we're concerned with these unfinished lines, roughly known as Aden or South Yemen, Sana or North Yemen. And then the Saudis took the north half of North Yemen. And politically, that still causes them problems because the tribes there are not particularly reliable. And the Saudi hierarchy always has to keep an eye uh, over the tribes. You go into the area and sitting up on the rocks, you can find people with arms. It's a little like the Wild West, I'd say. Something like the Wild West. And um, uh, all in all, though, great changes are taking place. So by 1922, he had it consolidated, and he completes the task and proclaims the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932. Now we're getting up very close to our day and time, you see, so you see how recent is the development of what we'll call the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, Abdulaziz had two things going for him. He was a man of great personal courage, a man of great charm. He knew, he just didn't know the word fear. And he certainly had a great capacity to make love. He married, here we may have to ask for some checking, but he married at least 22 times. Because as he consolidated his hold, he would take a wife in the tribe. Perhaps a chief died along the way. He took the widow and the kids with it and so on. And thus, 
there was a cementing of family ties that is so interlocked, it's like spaghetti. Everybody is really <laughs> linked to everybody else, not to say that they don't have their differences. But they seem also to be able to broker out those differences. Remember, I gave you the key word to my mind, consensus. And that is a very important element in the governing of the kingdom. You arrive at it by a consensus. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that it's to be equated by one of the uh, problems we have in this country of reducing everything to the lowest common denominator. I don't mean that. That isn't what I have in mind when I speak about consensus. In the marrying of some 20 wives and consolidating the interfamily relationships, he had a large number of sons. They are numbered variously. The going number that sticks in my mind is 41. I looked up a genealogical table uh, on the way out here. I could only find 36. I don't know if some fell out of the way or that fellow's research wasn't complete. A large number of sons, all of whom in turn had many sons. And in modern Saudi Arabia today, there are variously estimated to be on the low side 4,000, maybe on the high side 5,000 princes of the line. Now, how many Saudis are there? Are there? Actually, there aren't very many. I was in Saudi Arabia when we finally turned in the results of a census. And my recollection is we said, according to our count, that they numbered a little more than 4 million, around 4.62, something like that. I don't know how statisticians do this, counting people, but anyway, 4.62 million, which was a number absolutely unacceptable to the Saudi government. So we went back and had another count. And on the basis of finding some Bedouins not hitherto discovered, we were able to raise the number to around 7 million, and that was politically acceptable. And so the current account is on the order of 7 million. I suspect, I suspect that there are about 5 or 6 million Saudis, and that the rest of the population consists of variously guesstimated 1.5 to 3 million foreign, uh, foreign workers of one sort or another. I'll come to that point a little later. Suffice it to say, there are very few of them. They could easily become an endangered species. You may want to delete that from the tape. And uh, they are spread very thinly over this vast area. I find them very engaging, charming. Uh, they're passive. Americans seem to like them, and they seem to like Americans. Curiously enough, they're free enterprisers. They're practically Simon Pure Adam Smiths. This may come to you as a surprise. But they view the economic world as one of nearly pure competition, something that's almost gone out of style in this country, wherein we used to espouse free competition. I think we have large elements of what could now be called at least a mixed economy. The Saudi, apparently, is still reading <coughs> Adam Smith. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Now, what about the power structure of the royal family to finish at least the first item? In this large number of marriages, Ibn Abdulaziz had more children by some wives than he did by others. And one of his favorite wives came from the Suderi family. And you will find, even in our press today, references to the Suderi seven. Uh, his mother had been a Suderi. So this particular family was very strong in his personal attachment. And I want to mention the Suderi Seven because in dealing with the kingdom in the workaday world, these are very, very powerful princes and will give you some further insight into the way the government of the kingdom is organized. Well, the leading figure of the Suderi Seven is Crown Prince Fahad. He has canceled visits to the United States now twice. The most recent one, cancellation following the debacle at Fez, uh, which occurred last November. He is crown prince, and thus uh, we would think the designated successor to the president, present king, King Khalid. He's also first deputy prime minister 
the king is the king and the prime minister. Then his brother, Sultan, is minister of defense and aviation. That's a very, very important post in the kingdom, as it is in this country. Another brother, full brother, is Prince Salman, the governor of Riyadh, the, not only the Riyadh, the town, but the central area. Another brother, Abd al-Rahman, is the financial manager of the Suderi family, a very prestigious position of a very, very wealthy family. Another brother, Prince Naif, is the minister of interior. Now, interior in almost all other countries is not to be equated with Secretary Watts. Interior <laughs> has to do with security. He runs the police force, the Coast Guard, the intelligence services, and so on, the minister of interior. And Prince Turkey, the vice minister of defense and aviation, full brother to Sultan, and Ahmad, who was the deputy governor of Mecca, I've lost track because after the assault on the Great Mosque in Mecca, they sacked the governor of Mecca, Prince Fawaz, and I don't know whether the deputy minister got sacked also, but being a Sudari, I really can't believe they sacked him. Uh, so much for the Sudari seven, uh, the sons of just one of the wives of Abdulaziz, but I've practically given you the central part of the whole government. Another son of Abdulaziz was Faisal. Faisal, king of, uh, uh, from 1964 to 1975, also had a large number of sons. King Faisal, you'll remember, was assassinated while holding the Majlis. I want to talk about that just for the moment. People ask whether or not there is a way to express grievance, whether there is a way to make wishes and wants known in such a, a society. And the Majlis offers every Saudi, high and low, more entree to the chief executive officer than you and I could ever expect to have except by very special invitation in this country. And the king holds Majlis, an open chamber, an open session, and the most powerful and the most weak can come and wait their turn to whisper in the ear of the king, maybe leave a little piece of paper or something that has the wish or the want known. So what's going on in the kingdom most of the time? Faisal had a large number of sons, the most prominent of whom is Prince Saud, who is the spitting image of his father, very, very handsome young man, Princeton educated, flawless British English, fine mind, but not likely, at least near term, to see himself in line to be king. Although we could say he is kingly, I think we could say. He looks like a king. His brother, Turkey, is head of the intelligence system. Another brother, Muhammad, was the deputy minister of agriculture and water and also the president of SWIC, Saline Water Conversion Corporation. Saudi Arabia is converting more seawater to fresh water than any other country in the world. But Muhammad had a bad luck. He got interested in towing icebergs. <laughs> and I recall it may have involved someone here at Iowa State University. And I don't know whether it was a feasible project or not. I said to Muhammad when I was meeting with him on a on a project to build an experimental uh, desalting plant, which the pilot model would be the largest single desalting plant in the world. I'll get to that under the economic realm. I asked him, Prince Muhammad, your royal highness, you say your royal highness, how you Prince Muhammad, um, how about this uh, iceberg, won't it melt by the time it gets to Jidda? And he said, no. They put tarpaulins or something over the leading edge. And did I know that the speed of the iceberg passing through the water caused it to accumulate ice, not lose ice? I said, I did not. Then I asked him how he would cut it, and he said, with laser beams. I gather technologically it was possible. I also gather that the royal family didn't think much of the idea, and so Muhammad fell out of that job. Nevertheless, He's still a very important man. He's very much interested in agriculture and in the Sudan. Sudan, next 
door over here. And then another brother, Khalid, is governor of uh, Asir, no? Yeah, Asir. Well, I can't go all through all 4,000 princes. That might keep you here for some time. But you get an idea now of the point. The royal family literally has tentacles, could we say, feelers, antenna, into all parts of the society. And there is great compassion and concern for the members of the society. And the family is dedicated and have been from inception to do all possible in terms of justice and welfare and well-being. I hesitate to say that it's democratic in the sense that you may understand democratic, highly structured political process with both votes and ballots and all this. But by the same token, it has elements of access, freedom of access and expression, which to my mind are not so evident in some aspects of our society. What about the monarchy itself? It is not hereditary. In other words, the oldest son of the king does not automatically become king. The Arabic tradition is that succession goes to the most able, the most able of the male in line. And uh, the, pr the procedure is uh, sanctified, defend, or I should say, yes, sanctified in the, um, the uh, Sharia, the Muslim law. Abdulaziz, our hero, uh, 1902, 1953, when he died, dictated the succession. Apparently he had some notions about the British system, and he dictated his uh, successor, Prince Saud, the oldest son. Uh, gave the Saudis some pause because it looked as though the traditional form of succession was being modified. But Saud turned out not to be a very good ruler. The consensus for his succession was slowly eroded. It was a bit of a spendthrift. And in due course, the elders in council set him aside, and the then designated Crown Prince Faisal became king. But Saud did govern from uh, 1964, uh, 53 to 1964. Then Faisal succeeded. With Faisal's ascendancy, he immediately designated the successor of the crown prince, Khalid. From Faisal's assassination, Khalid, the present king, succeeded under the old tradition because there was an older brother, Muhammad, who, who was bypassed and who then renounced any claim to the throne. That Muhammad is the grandfather of the celebrated princess that you may have heard about because there was a picture and many, many stories about a prince and princess who violated Muslim law, sought to elope, and paid for that. It seemed, seems cruel to us, but I want you to understand that you must, I want you to, to grasp the seriousness of being a Muslim, the seriousness of obeying the, the tenets of the Quran, and the Saudis, I already told you, prescribed to the tenets of Muhammad ibn Wahhab, the most strict, shall we say, even the purifiers of the faith, are the defenders of the faith, the holy cities of Medina and Mecca. Well, are there limits on royal authority? Yes, there are. One, the sacred body of Islamic law, the Sharia, sets limits. The royal family itself, although they designate the successor in council, set limits on the power of the king. The ulama, the holy men, which is not a hierarchical religious order, but by consensus, certain who have gone to the mosque to study the Quran, to become versed in the scriptures, shall we say, are exceeded the privilege to become holy men and enforce the Sharia, but it's not deacon, vice deacon, bishop, archbishop, pope, and so on. This is quite different than the structure of the faith in Iran, by the way. The principal tribal leaders, the council of ministers, and the consultative council, which will be the senior emirs of all the tribes, plus the armed forces. It is a system of consensus. But the king, nevertheless, heads up all the powers. He is the focus of the powers. 
He is the head of the state. He is the sheikh of sheikhs, the leader of the sheikhs, the Arab of Arabs, we could say. He is the supreme religious leader, the defender of the faith, and he is the commander in chief of the armed forces. What then are the possibilities for uh, shift, abrupt, uh, uh, to, fall, to fall from power? Well, the reasons for stability seem to be these. The historic legitimacy which undermines the House of Saudi. The, the, the alliance between religion and ruler. The network of personal ties. These seem to be very, very strong. And then finally, the constant effort of the royal family to look after the welfare of all Saudis. There are some unknowns. The process by which decisions are arrived at in the royal family are not understood very well. They are most secretive. They're very, very private people. They live within the confines of their family. They will discuss with Westerners under certain guarded situations. But they are not running around blabbermouthing and leaking all day the way Washington does. That doesn't happen. So it's a bit of a job to get a good fix on what's going on in the royal family. Do I find, do I find perhaps a vulnerable point? I think most observers of the Saudi scene find a vulnerable point, but the Saudis themselves are very conscious of it. And that's the very, very difficult process of reconciling the modernization of the kingdom, uh, the infiltration of Western ideas, techniques, ways of behaving, and still preserving the very, very strict mores and scriptures of Islam. That's definitely in conflict. On the other hand, by observation, I would say this. It's amazing to see a young Saudi get on British Airways, shuck off his thub as the plane is airborne, put on his blue jeans and, and tennis, order a Manhattan, and have a good time in London, and then go through the reverse procedure coming back and seemingly adapt absolutely without any strain. So I believe that uh, they are not so susceptible to being undermined as some would think. Shall we leave the royal family there? All right, we'll let that go for the royal family. But that will at least give you some idea about how the country is governed and why I'm rather optimistic about the chances of the royal family continuing pretty much as they're doing for a long time. Excesses in the royal family, there are extreme wealth and opulence. Still and all, they're doing everything possible to share the bonanza of the oil income with the whole of the society. That brings us then to the, to the economy. Uh, uh, I notice, do, is my watch more or less correct? Well, we won't get very far on the economy. <laughs> Absolutely the most exciting experience I ever went through in my life the single biggest construction boom in history. All of a sudden, everything in sight is being torn down and being constructed anew as the petroleum dollars begin to roll in. And when did they begin to roll in? They began to roll in after the oil embargo of 1973-74. You see, they used the oil weapon then in order to bring about or help bring about pressure on the fourth of the major wars in that era. The War of Independence for Israel, 1948. The Suez Crisis, when we pulled the rug out of Israel from under Israel, France, and Britain. 1956, the famous War of 1967, when Israelis then launch out and defeat on all sides. And the return war then of 1973, which presumably Sadat didn't expect to win, but which Arabian arms would be vindicated and did a very good job in it. We brought about the ceasefire. So petroleum prices made a quantum increase as a result of the embargo, the second major increase in petroleum prices, 1978-79. So you go from around $4 a barrel to up to now $34 a barrel. But if you want to get an idea of the slow growth in petroleum revenues for the kingdom, in 1938, Petroleum revenues were three million bucks. 
cost of production 10 cents a barrel. 1960, petroleum revenues were $330 million. 1973, $4 billion. 1974, $22 billion. This year, $100 billion. Well, it's not going all to the royal family. They are building two enormous industrial cities, one at Yambu and one at Jubeil. This one is much larger, based on petrochemical complex, no longer simply an exporter of crude, but a processor of crude into all the things that you can think of as some petroleum derivatives. They have completed two pipelines across the kingdom from the Abkate refining uh, producing fields, one for natural gas and one for crude. Then they pump it on here and the tankers can go through the Suez. Not the big tankers, of course, the big tankers can't get through here. But they say 3,800 miles in doing that, in addition to which they're no longer throttled by the Straits of Ormuz. Before all the struggle of Iraq and Iran, 40% of the world's petroleum